Well done. Good evening. Um, it is so awesome to be here. Um, so I am Brenna Berman, as I said, and I was the CIO for, uh, in the city of Chicago for, so I was CIO for four years. I was first deputy CIO, which is nearly CIO, doing actually more work than the CIO for the year before that. And I was deputy budget director for the first year that Mayor Emanuel was in office before that. So that's six years with the city of Chicago which if you know about anything about working in the city, like Tom does, or Gene and Nick do, um, it's like dog years, so I'm ready to retire, uh, which I did at the end of March, at least from working in the city. I tried to take many months off, and my husband said, four weeks, and then we need a paycheck back, so I took four weeks. Um, I wanna take about 15 minutes and actually talk a little bit about, um, to be honest, not what I got done in those six years, but what, frankly, my amazing team got done, because my main job was dealing with, frankly, mostly legal and keeping the mayor away from my team. <laughs> um, and, but there was actually quite a bit that changed in, in those six years with how technology in the city works. And part of why I'm excited to have this conversation here on a Tuesday night is because many of you and many of the folks who may not be here but are often here, we're partners in that work. So this is like the perfect place to have that conversation um, because I think you understand it and, and we're part of that journey. So um, a couple things that, that I wanna share and then maybe a couple questions if there are any. Um, so, so Chicago's first tech plan really created this collective vision um, and some of you may actually know about that tech plan, um, but even if you don't, it was the first time that the city of Chicago actually stepped back and said, you know, well, what, what can technology do for the city of Chicago? And it talked about a lot of things that had nothing to do with city government. It talked about, um, you know, growing, growing the tech space as, as economic development, right? Startups and, and bringing um, large tech companies downtown. It talked about um, technology infrastructure like broadband, still lots of work to do there. It talked about technology and education and STEM investments. But it also talked about effective government and how technology can change how city government gets things done. And that's essentially what we focused on for five years um, and how we could really give technology a seat at the table in the mayor's office to change how government, how Chicago city government was doing things. And there were some significant changes in how that worked um, in a couple of specific ways. And the first one, um, and I know you, I think you hear a lot about this and some of you have helped us work on these specific projects um, or use some of the open data that's now available, but a lot, some of this, or one of the big ways was around how data and analytics are now core decision-making tools across departments. And, and you've got a couple pictures up there, some examples. Um, so the open data portal on the bottom, right? There's a new version of that out there recently. If you haven't seen it, um, you should go check it out. Um, there's, there's new ways to access data. And by the way, we use this, I still say we because I haven't been gone that long, um, but city departments use open data internally as, as much as, as outsiders do. So this was as much an improvement for city departments as it was for the public who accesses the data or companies who use the APIs. Um, and, and I can point to this change because the other day uh, in my new job, I needed to know what someone was paid and literally like went to go to the city data portal. I was like, oh wait, I don't have everybody's salary online anymore like I did at the city. Um, so what you're seeing up here is some examples like Open Grid, right, which puts all of our spatial data onto a map so people can see it and actually see where things are being delivered in the city. You're seeing one example of predictive analytics, right, that's a comparison of, of critical restaurant violations, right, the data-driven decision-making against the status quo. My, one of my favorite projects, right, the Array of Things, which is still ongoing, which I still get to be involved in, um, data coming online soon, um, but a project that took what, five years to actually bring into reality, which will continue to change the landscape of data in the city as it collects it and we share that publicly. But the biggest change here, right, because these trends are going on in, in other cities as well, right? Open data is almost an expectation in many cities. But here's actually what's changed in Chicago. Anytime the mayor's office or a department has a business initiative, right, um, no matter what it is, Part of that discussion now is, well, how do we make this decision? What data do we have? And, and to figure that out, they make a call to Tom. 
or there's the question of, okay, well, if we're going to make a, a big press announcement about some initiative, it's, well, what are the data sets that we need to add to the data portal to support this discussion in the public about whatever that initiative is? Um, a good example around this is um, the whole discussion that happened a little more than a year ago around, around bad landlords and problem buildings. Right, so the building department and the law department were working together to talk about how the city strengthened the tools that they had to sort of punish and call out bad landlords, ones who weren't taking care of their apartments and who were frankly putting their renters at risk in dangerous apartments. Um, and one of the things that they did was worked with the Department of Innovation and Technology around the data sets and the analysis they could do to identify those landlords to be more proactive in working with them. And that was actually, that's a real change. And now that's actually like the status quo in the process of how the city develops new initiatives. So now there's actually this real approach around data-driven policy making in the city of Chicago that wasn't there five years ago. Um, the second thing was actually this real initiative that, that certainly there were announcements around um, about you know, going paperless, which I love when people just think, well, well, how much money are you saving on paper? Well, I don't care. A box of paper isn't that expensive. This isn't about the paper. It's actually about getting these transactions online and looking at the processes and seeing how you make them more efficient and effective for the people that no longer need to come in and stand in line to talk to someone. And those efficiencies are two-part, right? It's about the resident or the business owner who's not standing in line at City Hall or some aldermanic office anymore to buy a permit or get a business license. It's also about the internal efficiencies for the city worker who's no longer updating an address for the person who stood in line to come in and update their address because that's not a high value service. They've now, you've now freed up five or 10 minutes for each address update because that's about the estimate. And when you add those together, right, so six address updates is an hour, imagine what that city worker can get done with that free hour doing some other high value piece of work, right? So this is about efficiency in city processes, not about, yes, it's all good to save paper, but it's not about that. It's about actually changing those city processes. And by the, by the beginning of 2016 or the middle of 2016, um, this, this sort of paperless approach had, had actually been achieved for both city permits, city licenses, which is all of CDOT, all of BACP, a couple of other departments thrown in there, and actually across the procurement process. So think about that one for a minute, which most people didn't realize was part of this. That's the city's internal contracting process and the external bid process, which is actually now done completely online. And if any of you had come before this and walked through the city's procurement office, you literally would have seen box after box after box of paper contract, now of which is all managed online, which is a huge efficiency um, for, the, for the parties involved in those processes, both internally and externally, um, which is a big change in how people view those processes. And then there's the one that is, frankly, pretty close to my heart, partially because it, it doesn't get the press release because nobody sees these, and, and for those of you that are actually in core operational tech, I think you'll share this with me. And these are the ones that are operational sustainability projects that, that nobody ever knows you're doing. They're hard to get done because the, it's not that the mayor's office doesn't care, it's that they frankly don't understand them. Try to explain VoIP to a policy person, and, and they don't actually, like if they save money, they care about them at budget time. But these aren't the ones that make news because they don't service residents in the near term, right? No resident cares that we migrated the city's entire email system to Microsoft 365. So why, why do we care about this? So one, when we started this, the city actually didn't have much that was functioning in the cloud. Well, why does that matter, right? So most of you know, but the cloud sounds like a fancy technology term. Why do we spend money on that? Well, while it dropped our email cost down from looking at Tom to see if he remembers, Tom disappears. Do you remember the number? It was like from $47 a person to $17 a person or something like that. Don't quote me because it was a while ago, but it was, that was the range, right? We didn't pocket those savings. What we did was actually use those savings to expand the reach of our email from the relatively small number of city employees to all employees, which now means we have actually a communication network that reaches all employees, which is pretty important. That may actually sound like, well, doesn't everybody have email? No, 
actually, that wasn't true back in 2014 when we did this. Not every city employee had email, which gives you the foundation to do things like deliver all your pay slips via email and not on paper. Think about that for a minute. Deliver your W-2s that way, right? City communications all going out over email. That's a big change. Um, it also was our first application that went out to the cloud. So I have to tell you about my budget hearing where I had Alderman say, well, well tell me what the cloud is. Because whoever named that, God help us, right? You can't actually sit there and say, it's just somebody else's data set. But, but why do we have to go to the cloud? In a budget hearing, explain to a bunch of aldermen what the cloud is. Um, but explaining to them the increased security, the increased reliability, the decreased cost. And when you do it for email, which is a technology everyone understands, when you then do it for your financial applications or your CRM application or whatever comes next, nobody asks any questions. And your data center gets smaller and your operational costs go down. And you have more money to do the interesting innovations that people do care about, that do get you press releases, that do actually get you better engagement with residents. So we did things like, okay, that cute picture at the top that looks like a truck with a bunch of pillars, that was us shutting down a road to build a new data center and lift <coughs> the coolers and the compressors to the roof of the building. So in my five or six years working at the city, I got to shut down a road to build a data center. I will probably never get to say that again in my life. So that was fun. Just got to put that one out there. We began migrating and adopted a, a strategy around cloud first. Will everything that the city does ever be in the cloud? Not for a long time. Not because we found things that don't belong in the cloud, because we have stuff that's old and it just isn't ready. So until we upgrade those applications, we can't go to the cloud. But we have a cloud-first strategy that stakeholders actually believe in and don't question anymore. Um, and we began doing migrations to things like, OK, the VoIP migration. What, why does that one matter? A 25-year-old Centrex phone system saves 50% on each phone line. The city has 43,000 different phone lines across like, all employees in its entire operation. That's massive savings. That brings new capabilities to city employees around collaboration and executing their jobs. So these sustainability projects never make news. I think if something had gone wrong with building the data center on the day we shut the road down, that might have made news. But knock on wood, that one went well. But it frees up money that the city wouldn't have otherwise and frees up headroom for the department to do innovation projects that it otherwise wouldn't get to do. So these are really important. But here I think is the best thing. So those are the three things that I would call out as sort of my legacy, if I can really use that word, of the time that I was there, that data is now present in every policy conversation the mayor's office has. And that's a huge change for the city of Chicago. That, that going paperless wasn't about saving paper. It was about the fact that technology can drive and support process change. And that, I think, will be the hallmark of major policy and process initiatives for the city going forward. And then finally, the, the recognition in both the budget office and the mayor's office that sustainability projects that aren't sexy actually create room and savings for technology initiatives that otherwise wouldn't be funded on their own. But here was, to me, the most important thing. Um, so that's not the entire team at Do It. Um, you can't actually get us all in a picture, but we did get 110 of us, that's almost all of us, out at a picnic one day. Um, so that's most of us. Um, there was a perception of do it when I started in, in the budget office in 2011 that the IT department were, um, that it wasn't a great skill set, that it wasn't particularly innovated, that when I took over as deputy CIO um, in the middle of 2012, that I probably was going to have to get rid of between a third and two thirds of that department to get anything good done. That's probably, that's a pretty dismal picture, right? I think when I took over, there were three people that chose to leave. Um, and everybody else was really, really excited about the opportunities we had ahead of us. Um, partially because we had a new mayor that got out of our way and let us do whatever we wanted. Partially because we had civic partnerships with people like those of you sitting here and elsewhere that we're creating pressure around things like open data, that we're stepping forward to do pro bono work and use that data to build apps that are making differences in neighborhoods. <coughs> and there's nobody in that department that isn't up to the challenge. So when Tom talks about those opportunities, 
those of you who are thinking about jumping into government should be excited about those opportunities because it's a great place to work because of those people who are there. There's nobody who's like anxiously running out the door at 4 o'clock or 4.30 because they're kind of just clocking it in and not committed to their job. The skills of that team are pretty amazing. Um, and we were able to get done all of those things I just talked about and then, and then some because of the people that were there on the day I started. Um, and now the opinion of the rest of the city department and I think frankly of people in the city and beyond because if you actually bother to go read the press, et cetera, right? Chicago is recognized as a leading smart city in the US and beyond. Um, we're recognized as a leading you know, data-driven city if you go and read some of the press. That was all done by the same team that nobody wanted to work with and that everybody thought I was going to have to fire most of. It's all the same people. So they just needed to be tapped into and excited and allowed to actually do the work that they wanted to do and listen to because all of that innovation either came from those people or through partnerships that those people were willing to take on. So I think the best part of my job was, was working with and partnering with the folks that I found there who just wanted a chance to serve their city through technology. Um, and for me, that was the most fulfilling part of the job. So, so that's my story. That's what I think we got done in the time that I was there. And I'm very proud of the chance that I had to serve my city through technology. That's what I got. OK, so now <laughs> any questions? Um, in the uh, drive to uh, go from a data-informed city to a data-driven city. Um, how, how, do you, how do you see the burgeoning uh, digital divide uh, being played out there and minimized? Um, yeah, no, that's, I think there's a real risk right now of the digital divide getting worse with the advent of more advanced technologies, right? IoT, AI, et cetera. Um, I think Chicago has a real opportunity to lead in addressing that problem if we take advantage of the, the methods and engagement models that we learned and pioneered under the BTOP grant when we took on the internet digital divide. Um, there are, there's some work afoot to attempt to do that, um, but we're going to have to get really serious about it really fast. Um, and there's, there's some people looking at that. There's a thing out there called the Connect Chicago Challenge where there's some companies investing in that. Um, but the proof will be in the pudding. We have an opportunity there, but, but we need to see if it works. You spoke of uh, reinvigorating the existing staff at the city. Uh, can you talk about the choices between teaching existing staff new skills versus relying on external contractors? and how you navigate that space? Yeah, no, that's, that's actually really tough. Um, so, so the department had relied on contractors in, in a couple of areas for a long time, um, and still, still does in some areas. Um, around, around infrastructure support, we've, we've got a really big contract. Around um, some types of app development, there's, there's contract work. Um, in newer areas, in like fields around like data science, et cetera, um, that's relatively homegrown or delivered through partnerships, depending on the volume. Um, I think that there's a there, there's growth in both of those areas. So you know the city has limited resources. So where we could, we engaged in in education through all sorts of things, right? So training when we could afford it, um, sort of side by side learning when we could do that. Um, sort of pro bono mentoring and externships when we could do that. Um, our interest is to do more in-house work for, for things that are, or was, <laughs> more closely held because there's just certain skill sets you have to have in-house. I think one of the areas where we really focused on growing in-house, which for whatever reason I left off as a slide, when I started we did not have a CISO or an information security office at all. And for for strategic reasons, um, and, and I still believe that, that should not be and is still not outsourced. Um, and so to grow that, to hire that and grow that um, in-house was, was a challenge and one I think that, that the city met and continues to meet. 
Um, so <coughs> we need to make some strategic decisions where to invest and where to continue to contract. Um, and it's always a hard decision, but one that the city sort of prioritizes and, and makes those decisions around that. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm thinking about what you're saying about Chicago being known as a smart city and a technologically advanced city. And, you know, I think among kind of like GovTech nerds and Code4 people, Chicago might have that reputation. But I think people from mostly like people from other states or other countries, when they hear Chicago now, they say they think about shootings, violence, um, lack of safety and not smart there. city. I was speaking specifically about the IoT Smart City moniker. We are absolutely known as that. You can be both. <laughs> I guess my question is, how did you see your work in IT relating to the kind of broader issues happening in Chicago? So, in this, to be honest, this is something that I think challenged all of us at the time. So, I know that I felt um, challenged and, and honored by partnering with departments on some really tough issues in the time that I was there. Um, and um, felt like we missed opportunities to work on other issues, partially because of how the city was structured. So um, in my time there, you know, we got to work on issues around homelessness and food deserts and minimum wage and um, any other number of, of quality and, and societal issues. Um, my department does not work on, on crime or CPD related issues. We do work on other public safety issues um, with fire and OEMC, uh, the Office of Emergency Management. So there's a, there is a structural divide in the city where the technology that supports the police department is a different department. Um, so to give you a bit of a bureaucratic answer, um, that th though separate from that is the data portal obviously does <coughs> carry the crime data, so there was some really interesting work done with how that was visualized. Um, but besides that, we didn't actually do work related to how technology could support that within my department. So I think from my perspective, we worked on some very interesting um, sort of community empowerment and equality issues some of the ones I mentioned, but we didn't actually work on those crime issues. Other questions? Actually, if I can add one, I think the one exception to that, I think, would be the role that the array of states will play in, um, in providing a really broad base of data that is going to inform a whole cadre of issues around the disparity across Chicago communities. Um, not necessarily, because not all of those things have to do with city investment, right? It's not necessarily city investment that impacts air quality. Sometimes it is, I'm not saying it's not. So it won't always necessarily be city investment, right? Um, because wh where the state highway goes is not necessarily a city decision. Some of it will be. But I think, but, but I think the data and, and what that can inform is going to be incredibly interesting in terms of, of the, of in terms of environmental quality, in terms of all sorts of just the ba that base data and what it informs about communities is going to be really interesting. This is more a comment than a question. I just wanted to tell you, you did a great job. You've done a great job. There's been such forward advancement, especially in the last few years. Um, something you didn't mention that I just am a big fan of is how you digitalized the underground of Chicago, got that well documented so we knew we know there's where the power lines are, where the gas lines are, the fiber. Well, um, that one's not done yet, but thank you. Okay, <laughs> yes. And then the security piece. I actually saw you at a security conference um, a cybersecurity conference, and just how you have brought that to uh, local government, um, kudos. So I wish you well. Thank you. <laughs> That's a good Thank you. you know, it's funny, for, if there's anyone here who's been like a CIO or worked in operate, right, your, your to-do list is always longer than anything you get done in a day, and that was still true on my last day. And I think one of the things that 
made it easier for me to leave, because it was very hard, is um, the, the woman who, the, so around the CIO and any, any commissioner in the city, right, the mayor nominates and the city council approves. So the mayor is, is nominating the woman who was, was my first deputy at the end, she's current CTO, she's been with the department. So there's, there's some continuity there because cause my view leaving is always there's, there's a million, like, there might be a hundred things I got done and a million things I didn't. Um, and so I kind of feel good that there's actually quite a bit of continuity in the team that, that hopefully will continue to get done that million things that I still view on my list is not done yet. Um, because there's just always still more to do and quite a bit of investment still to be made. Um, and those things are always very, very easy to see, but thank you. Uh, I have a question with like the Internet of Things and security. Did anybody, uh, is anybody concerned or push back about like mass collection of data or just like, yeah, just how, how things are being handled or stored or what's being captured? Um. There's, there's so many things. So yes, deeply concerned. Um, so uh, I'm trying to figure out which part of that you want me to answer. So, um, so like, so internally, um, I mean, there's there's a there's a whole way to describe to you how the the data that the city has is is organized, managed, and, and protected. So, and that that follows sort of what any CISO would stand here and describe for you um, in terms of you know public, private, sensitive, and confidential data, whatever this, I got that probably a bit off. Um, in terms of um, what might be closer to your question, in terms of how the city approaches privacy and the collection of data from the public way, um, one of the, the sort of best ways to understand that would probably be to go and look at the Array of Things website, which was sort of our first foray into collection, from an IoT perspective, into collection of data from the pub, in the public way, right, which is where, where IoT for government gets particularly interesting and where the, the work around that is, is sort of new and developing. Um, and, and we, and I'm not saying we got it perfectly right and the work there is still developing and there's actually plenty of room for, for folks in this room to get engaged in that and I would welcome that. Um, but as we were getting the array of things ready to, to go up and to, for the first ones to be installed, like our commitment was we would, we would publish a privacy policy um, around the data we would be collecting and how it would be managed and what we were collecting um, and that we would, that the public would have a chance to, to have input and comment and vet that privacy policy. Um, and that's actually, we've, we've done our best for that to be a very transparent, it's an open source project in terms of both the technology and the, the management processes and the policies. So if you go to the Array of Things website, you can actually see all of that. Um, and the process we went through was like in January of 2015, like 15, um, but in January, we got a group of like of experts together from the ACLU and EFF and this this <coughs> IoT privacy expert from West Point. I don't know who found her, but she was actually amazing um, to help us draft the privacy policy, right? So, and I, I feel like I should make that caveat that you get in like books and interviews, right? They are responsible for all the good stuff. We were responsible for all the mistakes, um, but they gave us great input and we drafted. We then went through both an online and an in-person process of getting input from, from communities, et cetera, on, on that privacy policy and, and adjusted based on that input. Um, and, and that's available online. Um, it, will get, it will be reviewed either as it needs to be updated because of some change to the AOT instrument itself or once a year like a, as well. Um, so you can, you can go and take a look at that and it's actually very, and one of the things that's different from that privacy policy from others we had seen is most privacy policies tell you what they won't do and are silent on what they will do, which leaves the whole uni universe open. We flipped that and it says exactly what we will, what we will do and nothing else. So it, it really restricts the project. Um, purposely because of, you know, the need to sort of maintain public trust in terms of collection in the public way. Um, so, so we took privacy and, and security on that project very, very seriously, especially since it was our first to kind of set the tone um, for managing public projects like that going forward. And we will follow that model at, at City Digital as well. Um, all of our projects thus far have not captured any personal information from a City Digital UI Labs perspective, um, but we'll follow that model going forward as well.
Oh, hey, sorry. Um, I was curious if you could talk a little bit about, um, so I'm currently at CTA and I think there's that constant struggle of uh, whether to go with a Band-Aid solution, like Band-Aid short-term solution, or to address the long-term problem which requires more resources. Um, so I'm wondering how, especially with these sort of, as you'd call them, like not sexy projects um, that were very essential for laying foundational work, how you reoriented this, you know, the conversation to make the case for those projects, especially, I know you talked about sort of um, ha re reframing things in budget terms to try to explain what the cloud would do, um, but things like going paperless, you know, that being an improvement on the user end, how you did that? That is almost impossible. Very good question. Um, and, and to be honest, there were some projects that were were absolutely critical that until we could create a sort of, of political burning platform, we couldn't get off the ground. Um, but, I mean, so for the VoIP one, that was great because it, it had its own savings, so it sort of paid for itself. Um, with, the, with the data center, that one actually worked out because we were getting, uh, we were, the, the old data center was in a space we had to pay rent on. So a lot of our sort of, of sustainability projects actually had a financial component. Um, so getting the budget office on your side can be helpful if you can find a way to f either at least self-fund that project itself or hopefully kick out some savings um, beyond that. Um, the paperless one actually had a, had a, an, a mayoral initiative attached to it. Right, because the mayor is very sort of is very pro business, and so he had a whole <laughs> bunch of initiatives um, beyond just the paperless one that had to do with making it easier for companies to do business in Chicago. Right, so there was a normalization of business permits and licenses, et cetera. So that was part of that um, because that one actually cost money. Right, um, and frankly, quite a bit because uh, we had to touch some of our oldest legacy systems, which. And to be honest, we actually tried very hard to build in some, some modernization work into those beyond what the project required to kind of shore up some of those older legacy systems, which, which frankly, we were not particularly successful in that extra work just because of the cost component of it. Um, so that's actually the trick. I mean, because of the, the election cycle and the budget strain that, that many governments are under, not just Chicago, because I, I was, I'm, was lucky I had and still have a really close network of, of city CIOs around the country. This is an ongoing struggle because some of these big legacy projects have much longer durations or larger um, uh, price tickets on them than a mayor can handle in their political cycle. Um, and I've never figured out how to crack that, that particular one. I mean, we've looked at models around, like, what would it look like to outsource the entire department? Like, what's the buyback and the funding model around that um, to bring in investors to do that? Because there is actually, and like, and then you, if, you, if you go look at the, the federal government and what they're facing around the age of some of, I mean, you're talking about 35 and 40 year old giant legacy systems on the federal side. I mean, if you talk to some of the guys that, that left their, their comfy Google and whatever jobs to go deal with healthcare.gov, they live in fear of what might happen on the federal side. Um, is there is actually a day of reckoning coming around the large legacy systems going down and no good model right now to deal with that. And then probably, sorry, there's really just no good answer to that question because um, the, the political cycle doesn't support an answer to that. Um, and currently the traditional funding around large capital replacements have shrunk because of the use of bond funding. And, and frankly, the biggest thing that we're doing now to try and help with that is a lobbying push. Like if this big, this magical giant ball of infrastructure funding that the federal government's talking about is coming down is we're doing a big push of either having that classified, like having them talk about infrastructure to include IT infrastructure as infrastructure or to make sure that we can pay for technology components in traditional infrastructure spend, because that may help. We'll see if that happens. So there's a big lobbying effort around that. Okay, so we have time for one more. Oh, really? Is the last one? <laughs> Hi, Brenna. <laughs> so I was wondering if you could talk at all about the future. I'm just curious about what's gonna be happening with UI Labs in the city, and if, if there's anything that you could talk about generally. Uh, Obviously, with your background, I would think there might be some kind of 
I don't know what's going on. So. I had trouble getting any other jobs. So. <laughs> um, yeah, no, so the, I mean, the partnership between UI Labs and the city is a really close one. So the city is an active partner in all of the pilots that we do at City Digital. So, so City Digital, for those of you who you don't know, and you are all welcome to come and visit. Um, it's on Goose Island, so beware. It took me 35 minutes to get from like Division and Cherry down here today. Um, it seems so close. Um, but I'm serious, you are all welcome to visit. Um, it's, so the city is part of all of the pilots that we do. We do infrastructure IoT pilots and work with our corporate partners to, to bring those to market um, in other cities. And uh, right now we're working on things like uh, mobility and how you drive, how you drive down congestion with employer side demand management, right? Um, with the CTA is our big partner on that one. Um, and we're looking, we're working with the OMC and the health department around how the city can be better prepared. So we're like super prepared for snow, because like you have to be in Chicago. The city is less prepared for major heat events like we were in 1995 when 107 people died on one day. Um, and partially because they happen less often, but given the, how the patterns of climate change look, they're likely to happen more often in the next 10, 20 years, so the city wants to be better prepared. So we're working with them, um, them with the city and NASA around better preparedness for high heat, in sit for high heat events. Um, so we work in like on really specific pilots with the city as a partner, and that will continue to be our model. So actually, what I love, um, you know, and Danielle didn't come tonight, who who will be the new CIO, so I can say things like that. Is I left behind all the like 3 a.m. operational calls because some system went down. I left all that behind and got to keep all the like really good IoT work that I was doing at the city. It's kind of how I view this job. So I see us doing more work like that together, which is really exciting. Um, and it continues to add, I think, breath to the city's commitment to use IoT. And I think the most exciting thing is um, I took this job because what we're doing at City Digital is, is in working with the Smart Chicago Collaborative, which I think many of you are familiar with, um, is we'll be working really closely with them um, to add to the work we're doing, which has been very, um, our partners thus far and all of our work have been corporations, startups, um, academics in the city. Um, what's missing from that are people, like residents, right? There's no, <laughs> and that's what Smart Chicago was really good at, right? Bringing the voice of residents into the adoption of technology. Um, and it's really hard to think about a mobility pilot without talking to some riders. <laughs> Right? Um, so Smart Chicago has become a partner in all of our pilots to bring the, the voice of the resident, um, not just the voice of the resident in from like a user testing experience, but up front from a co-design approach. Um, so we're actually going to be drastically changing the method of how we do things um, based on this idea that, that you really shouldn't deploy any technology on people. You should deploy it with the people that are going to be affected by it. Um, so I'm pretty excited about that change in method. So. Um, yeah, so it's pretty exciting. So that's so. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this, and I'm very serious about that invitation for any of you that are interested in coming up to the lab to see what we're doing. So thank you very much. Thank you very much.